Let me just say how utterly pleased I am to be here uh, with you uh, to listen to the uh, first gentleman of the church, Thomas Stratford, hold the choir together here, amen, <laughs> and, to <laughs> and to see the live streaming where everything that's being done here uh, in this part of God's creation in Brentwood, Maryland, is going out to many other states, even as far as the West Coast. So we may be humble in numbers and so forth, but we're at least we're in our own house again. The last time I, the last time I was uh, here in the Bible study, some of you who were uh, here, we had a wonderful time, um, you were uh, subletting uh, and uh, renting and, <laughs> and sharing space that from, with another church, but it's always so much better to have your own place. And so when I came in today, uh, I was just so impressed because I was informed that this wasn't a, a contracted out, but this temple was actually renovated by the members themselves. And I say, what a wonderful, beautiful job that you have done. When we put, it, put our minds to it, it's amazing what we can do when we take serious the lyrics of the last song that was shared by the choir, Falling in Love with Jesus. But you know, friends, during this Advent season and these weeks of December leading up to the Christmas Day, we call Advent, means the coming of the Christ child being celebrated his birthday yet again uh, with blood shed all over the world, children dying and being slaughtered and starving, Greedy people not caring anything about the less fortunate. The way in which you have a Mitt Romney running for president and could stand up there and say that 47% of the people basically don't count and that we're all, we're all just uh, begging from the government. And, and the Lord had to let him know that there is such a higher authority than the president of the United States. Amen. So I tell you, I was a little nervous there for a while because I didn't know whether the Lord was going to rebuke this country for being so greedy and selfish and all other kind of problems. But when I went in over in Maryland and in Maryland to cast my battle, I said, Lord, please, <laughs> don't abandon us now. Now, let's face it, I, I don't like it that Barack Obama feels he's so locked into this presidency he can't even mention the poor see 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 we got a the brother now you uh, now you don't have to get reelected again so i do want to hear something about the poor something about the jobless and there's something about black people you know now we've carried it for four four years now but with so many of our young people in the prisons and the detention centers and the bloodshed on it and in our presidency he's being muzzled he can't say nothing now, now, you know, that, that's got to change because there's no excuse for it now. So I want, if you can help out the gay people and the old people and the Jewish people, why can't you help out the black people? See, so that's what I need to know because I told the, even the AME bishop, if we have to go downtown and if we have to have a quiet vigil in front of the White House, just with candles, don't need to make any kind of noise, just stand there. And if anybody asks us what we're doing on it, we're just here to remind Barack and Michelle that we are black people. And we don't hear very much coming from our black brother. Amen. Now he's had four years to placate the white folks. But now we are here. We want a little bit more than a symbol. Ain't enough now. Can't put food on your table. Okay, let me get to my message. I'm sorry. But I had to get these preliminary remarks out. <laughs> you can tell that I feel a sense of being at home uh, with, with, with Pastor Stratford. And, and Stephanie has just been doing such a marvelous job. And your support of her has been just admirable indeed. For so long, women have have really led the church in numbers and in their prayers and in their gifts. Women have. Well, men have taken the credit, but the women have done the work. But, uh, but, but we haven't really allowed for the affirmation of the females in ministry as we certainly should be doing. 
And so I am happy that non-denominational fellowships, uh, going back to the original Greek name, He Ecclesia, the church itself, is now being going back to the time in the very beginning. People don't realize this in the first century when there were a number of women pastors who are heads of churches. I talk about this in chapter uh, 8 of Troubling uh, Biblical Waters. Uh, and how the fact is, and the church, unfortunately, for very conservative reasons, uh, began to suppress women, and that's a long story we'll have a chance to talk about. So we are now seeing the resurgence of, the, the resurgence of women, uh, and uh, not coming to... Uh, with a new word, but just a new kind of leadership and reminding the men, like we must remind us of people, Barack Obama the president, that uh, of certain basic things which cannot be acknowledged any longer. I'm sick and tired of the women not getting proper credit for their role in keeping the church alive. Now, I want to trouble... Uh, your souls a little bit further by saying I may be troubling my soul if I don't find my glasses. Amen. What did I do with my glasses? Did I leave them in the room down there? Oh, no, I have them. All right. I used to wear glasses, you know, for, uh, for styling purposes, you know, just to look cool. <laughs> but as I got older, I need these brothers. <laughs> now they are absolutely essential. I want to turn your attention uh, to the book of Jeremiah, and in the 31st chapter, you may say see the priest of the Old Testament, just rise to the New Testament, amen. Uh, but here, in the book of Jeremiah 31, verse 15 through 17, there occurs a passage that Matthew's gospel, and our dominant text for this morning is going to be Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 18. Uh, it's an episode in the infancy narrative of Jesus as, as recorded by the Gospel of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. And there are two, two Old Testament passages that are cited by Matthew in chapter 2, verses of Matthew 2, uh, 13 through 18. So let's go to one of them, the second one that Matthew will eventually quote. It's found here in the book of Jeremiah. You should have it. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15 through 17. It's very important as I challenge you here at the, at the uh, uh, Ecclesia Family Worship Center today to really reflect on the subject which I'm going to share with, with you as being the Advent, a time of preparing or preparation for receiving the gift of the Christ child. But it's a time of preparing ourselves, not just to celebrate another birthday for Jesus, because Jesus does not need you to give him a birthday party again. But it's a time for you to rethink the significance of Jesus' birth as a reason for you to stop focusing upon giving things and gifts, which many of you can't even afford, many of us can't afford, but to, instead of giving things, give of yourself. Instead of celebrating the birthday of Jesus alone, why not you becoming a gift to someone who needs to receive it from you? And maybe it has the gift that you can be may have nothing to do with a physical gift that you got to go to Macy's or go to one of these stores to buy or stand in line all night at Best Buy to get a, a, a television or, a, you know, if you want to stand in line all night, that's your business. But I just want you to understand that the new owners of Best Buy are making millions of dollars at you being out there like a fool standing all night. They sitting back at home in their comfortable beds. They ain't standing out there all night. Lord. Um, <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15 and following. Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. 
She refuses to be consoled or comforted for her children are no more. Thus saith the Lord, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is a reward for your work, says the Lord. They shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future. The Hebrew word for hope is uh, hatikva. And I say this because definitely she's been studying Hebrew lately and directly in a class from, uh, from Jerusalem. And uh, I first studied Hebrew when I was a student at Oxford back in 1967 and 68. Uh, that very year, 68, when Dr. Martin Luther King died, I was in a Hebrew class over there in England. So there is tikva, the hope for your future. And uh, says the Lord, and your children shall come back to their own country. Weeping at first, Rachel, the mother of Benjamin, uh, the w mother of Joseph in the Old Testament, weeps for her children every time she saw the devastation coming upon the people of Israel. Every time that they saw them being carried off into slavery in Babylon, Rachel symbolically was weeping as the mother of Israel, the mother of both Benjamin and Joseph, the mother of those of her own people who now are being destroyed by the, by the enemy. And I might say that uh, it's a very sad thing, and it's recalled by Matthew in the infancy narrative of Jesus, there in chapter 2, as we will see in just a moment. And, uh, and yet it's followed that by the refrain in verse 16, thus saith the Lord, keep your voice from weeping and your, and your eyes from tears, for there is reward for your work. So in other words, beyond the weeping, weep for a while if we hurt, but don't stay weeping. You got to clean your face up and get yourself together and get to work. See, you can cry for a little while. My mother used to give us beatings. I mean, you know, back in the old days, I thought she kind of beat us a little bit too much. <laughs> she, she used whatever she that lady could get her hands on. It was a razor strap. Of course, today I could have her arrested because, you know, <laughs> the, poli the schools and the teachers, they don't let you discipline your children like you need to. So, uh, yeah, I, I had my daughter stayed out half the night. I told her she had a one o'clock curfew. That was generous. I said, you can't get back in at 1 o'clock. So, you know, she was going to give me bad mouth when I was being Mr. Mom, and I had to show a few things. I still, I may be old, but I ain't that old. So, therefore, so the next day she went to school, and uh, the, the, the school nurse, there was no marks on her. I thought, made sure I didn't try to leave any marks. That's ridiculous. Amen. <laughs> so here comes the police at my door at my house. Yeah. And they said, uh, hello, Miss Bell, just a kid, Bell, yeah, yeah. I said, oh, she's upstairs in the room, you can go check her out. She said, there's nothing wrong with her, she's just a little hurt pride, that's all, because she got a little spanking, you know, the old-fashioned way. I said, uh, but go on up there. But uh, prior to the police coming, I first went up to see my daughter, when I saw the car pulling up, I said, well, that's probably who they are. I said, I want you to tell, your mother gave you to me to raise, because you gave her such a fit up there in Chicago, so she sent you to me. So now, if you have me arrested today, where do you think you're going to be? I said, well, I, well, I said, yeah, you're going to be a child of the state because your father and mother are not available to help you. So you better pray that nothing goes on right here. <laughs> so I went on back down and said, the police went upstairs. And uh, they came, the woman came down, you think this is interesting. She came down, she says, you know, Dr. Carter, I don't know why they waste our time. That's a happy child up there. I said, I know she's happy. <laughs> she's happy that you're leaving. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so then she, the police lady was leaving, and I said to her, I said, uh, no, she said, uh, I don't know why they're wasting our time like that. I said, wait, wait, before you leave. She said, yes, sir. I said, do you have another unit you could send out? I said, she said, well, what do you mean? I said, these children are out of control. They just, we, we have no authority whatsoever. Can you have a parental abuse uh, squad? <laughs> That's what I need to see. You know what that police woman said to me? She says, if they form one, I'm going to be the first one in line. <laughs> 
sent my kids at home but totally out of control. <laughs> but in this text, it tells us there is hope for your future. There is a reward after the tears. So, yes, the tears are important. And maybe that's why Matthew, when he's writing the story of Jesus in chapter of the book of Matthew, the book that's most Jewish and that opens the New Testament, it is that Matthew goes back to this episode in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 16 and 17. Uh, so important uh, to reflect on. A voice, a woman's voice, a mother's voice, weeping over her children because there's so many problems that she faces, sometimes alone, and uh, trying to raise up the children. And yet in the community and in the churches, the children's future is being compromised. And she's weeping because so many of them are being slaughtered. A day doesn't go by that we don't read the newspapers, and we can see how young people, are now boys and girls, like some of these girls sitting over there in that pew right over there, not paying attention to the preacher. Amen! Wake up! I'm trying to express concern about you, and you back there gossiping and whatnot. Not paying attention, and you are being offered a reward for your future if you get to work. We must do the work of Christmas, and then the work of Christmas is not just about buying gifts. The work of Christmas is re-examining and preparing yourself. This last night I was going home from my office after working on this sermon. I, I was driving home and I, I listened to the Christmas music on, uh, on, the, uh, on the radio. And I was so pleased to see there the Christmas mu- the, to hear all these tunes. And I noticed how I was beginning to feel more, more in the Christmas spirit, so to speak. You know, I was feeling good spot. But I said to myself, isn't it strange that they play these songs once a year at Christmas time, and I am now having this good feeling of spirit of Christmas. I said, why can't we do this more often? Why can't we have Christmas in July of spirit, not of material possessions? Why can't we have the Christmas spirit all year round? Like Black History Month should be all year round. But it shouldn't be if we fall in love with Jesus. Unfortunately, too many of us will sing this song and fall out of love the minute we leave the church. See, in other words, it's not enough to fall in love with Jesus, but it's to stay by his side. It's to let fall in love so you stay in love. Amen. See, that's the nice part about it. So that, and that's where many of us have our troubles. If you become, it's like Christmas, as I'll say here. Christmas. You know, the mass in Christmas uh, really referred to the Catholic Church's tradition of the Holy Mass that was done at Christmas. But in Spanish, if you do a little slate of hand, slate of hand, you could say, well, in Spanish, the word mass means what? All right. So then Christ means what? Christ. So more Christ in us. So Christmas means more Christ in us. Following in love is not enough. You, we, we got to stay in love in such a way that the spirit of Jesus Christ informs how we become the gift to others. There's nothing more powerful than becoming a human gift to somebody in need. Somebody who needs to hear a healing word. Somebody who's been down and depressed even thinking about suicide. Someone who's been a victim of too much yelling at the household. Oh, I'm going to tell it here now today. We still yell, leave church and go home and yell at each other. The, the spirit is gone. The sense of pride that we should have is gone. And we tend to hold grudges and we tend to want too much revenge. All of the things that, that would take away the spirit of Christmas reigning in our hearts. And if more of us could begin to live that spirit more than just during the days of Christmas. I'm not told my wife, I'm not buying anything this Christmas for you. 
And she told me, honey, that's nice because I sure ain't buying nothing for you. I said, that's good because why don't we this Christmas, let's be more of a gift to one another. Let's, 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 let's take the money and let's just spend it going on a little place. And that's what we've already got it set up. Nice little vacation. That's going to be our Christmas together. But nothing material can be bought. But she got everything she needs anyway, so I don't know what the heck that, you know, one Christmas I wasted all that money, I bought a baby grand piano, trying to impress her, and then, uh, th- then she said, well, you know, honey, you shouldn't have gotten quite that baby grand piano, because I went out and got you that nice watch that you watched, oh, Lord, can we pay for all this? So we would spend the whole next year trying to pay for this. Another time that I went out and caught myself doing something, but material things, until I've said enough of it. First of all, we ran out of money and I'm throwing away all the credit cards. We have to be a gift to one another. We have to have the Spirit of Christ in us so that we, in the giving of material things, do not miss out on the most important thing, which is the love that must sustain us in this family for the long haul. Now, let's be truthful. Think about it. When is the last time some of you parents have actually told the children that you love them? You know, how many, how many, or, or your spouse, or your significant other, or your partner, whatever their relationship, if you're supposed to be having some kind of special affection for this other person in your life, when is the last time you've actually said, I'm going to be, let's be a gift to one another? You don't have to go down there and buy no lottery tickets, hey amen. <laughs> Hoping that that's going to change your life. I would ask you to raise your hand there how many people bought the lottery ticket. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. That, when, that thing, when that part got over 500 million, I mean, I was in the line myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, last night, some of you are not aware of this, last night at sundown, the season for Jewish people, the season of Hanukkah, the festival of Hanukkah began. And you, have, you can hear some of them say, Happy Hanukkah. Well, Hanukkah represents that time. It's referred to in the, fourth gospel, in the, in the gospel of John, chapter 10, as the, the festival of dedication, the Jewish festival of dedication. That's a time when, uh, in the time of what we call the Maccabean Revolt, about 164 uh, B.C., uh, uh, when the, uh, the, the Syrians, called the Seleucids, and they had a crazy king like Hafez Azad right now over there in Syria about to drop all these bombs on them. I don't know, what happens to people when they get in power like that? Now, just rather than to lose, or as he's losing, he wants to unleash all of this, maybe all, all of these chemical weapons on his own people. Can you believe that? Well, this, is, this happened before because, but because uh, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, the, when he had this uh, 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 ability to take over the city of Jerusalem, he then, in a very arrogant way, went in the Holy of Holies called the uh, uh, Kadosh HaKodoshim, the, the, the most sacred place in the sanctuary. It's where uh, the king, uh, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, a crazed individual with power and wanted to desecrate the temple. Not realizing that if it's the Holy of Holies, you don't go in there with a corrupt mind. Because whether you believe in God or not, that doesn't mean that God's presence is not there. So that you can think you're going in there as a king, as I said before, or a president or whatever, but there is a higher authority that has been here since human beings have started this journey on earth. And you don't If you don't, if you're not careful, then you will find out the hard way that the Holy of Holies is not to be desecrated. And shortly thereafter, of course, uh, Antiochus IV Epiphanes was thrown from his throne, was thrown out, and the temple was purified by the Jews. The priests came back into the temple. They took the Olympian Zeus, the statue of the Olympian Greek god Zeus, and they took it out and they reestablished the Ark of the Covenant in the uh, Holy of Holies. And right before the mercy seat where on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, that's where the prayers of the people are to be given. 
Well, I say that because last night at sundown began the Jewish festival of Hanukkah. And you say, Happy Hanukkah. That means rededication. So this is a season of Advent. It's a time of rededication. For the Jews, rededication, because this was a time when the temple was reconsecrated and restored to its purity. Uh, the sacred space that was devoted to the Lord was now established in the temple, reestablished. And we should have reestablished in our own temples of our bodies and spirits the same rededication, not just of material gifts in a capitalistic society where you're just making the rich people richer and they're laughing at you sitting in front of your little flat screen TV. Well, again, I gotta be honest, I got two or three of them in my house as well, amen. <laughs> but it's part of the culture. And if you're not careful, you begin to get caught up in this culture, and so then you too start acting like the enemy yourself. Because the only thing that matters is the things. But this Christmas, we are challenging you in this Sunday of Advent to rededicate yourself, not to things, but to rededicate yourself to becoming a gift yourself. That you can become a gift uh, as you celebrate the birthday of Jesus this year. You African-American women who are the contemporary Ramas of our time, Many of you are weeping quietly today for one reason or another. You have a child who's critically ill. You can't help. The doctors don't seem to be helping. You may, you may have a child who's in jail. You may have one who's strung out on crack cocaine, on drugs. Who knows? You may have a, a spouse or a husband or a living boyfriend or some Negro who's in there and he ain't half the time there to help you out when you really need it. Got more excuses than any other thing. Oh, Lord, some of the brothers are pathetic. And I know because I'm one of them sometimes. We don't always do what we really are supposed to do. And how wonderful. That's why I say we talked about my, my, my daughter when I had to become Mr. Mom for two and a half years. And uh, I never realized how much these single parents have to go through. I mean, I thought I was doing something by sending my child support on time, you know what I mean? I, you know, just put a check in the mail, take it by there, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm all right now. Well, the fact of the matter was, that was nothing. I wasn't going to PZA meetings. I wasn't have to drive a child around during the day to all these extra appointments that they have. The things that we expect the mothers to do all the time, thankless, and we fathers, we just stand back and waiting to be praised on Father's Day. You ain't doing nothing as a parent unless you fully understand what it means to have a responsibility of raising up some children. Now, if it wasn't so bad on many of our families, that's why I'm talking as candidly as I am then we wouldn't have so many of our young people going to what we call fictive kinship arrangements, alternative kinship arrangements like gangs, girls, teenagers, they form gangs because something's missing in their real home. And so they go out and form other kinds of what we call fictive kinships. Uh, and then they become like a mob and they think it's funny to uh, humiliate other people and to and, and to take their clothes or their nice jackets or whatever foolishness is out there. Things! Too much focus on things. And not enough focus on the spirit. A spirit which should be represented by the birth of Jesus and the weeping of Rachel. Let us dry up her tears. Let us watch the self-destruction and the abuse that takes so many forms, as I've mentioned, in our various households. We need to look at all of the things in our ego that, that stand in our way, that hinder our growth, that hinder our walk with the Lord. We want, we want too much of what we think other people have. You know, it's just sad how much we get envious of what we think other people have. My wife told me one time, she said, uh, Ken, you know, people are always talking about, you know, that uh, they want to, this and that, that other people are so lucky and whatnot. If you only knew 
the problems that other people have. She says what they should do is to take all of the problems, ask all these people that they think are doing so well, and take all of those people and to write down uh, all the problems that they have in their life and put it in a bag. And then you collect all of those, those little pieces of paper and put it in there. And then you put your problems in there. You put your paper in there. And she said, but leave your paper with a star on it so you can find it when you need to, if you need to. And then she said, shake the bag right up. And she said, stop pulling out those other slips of paper for other people's problems. You don't know what problems people have that you think are doing so well. You don't even know if they're paying their bills. You don't even, yeah, they got the show, but you don't know what's behind all of that show. So you may, and you don't know what kind of illnesses are going on in their body. And you are envying this, that, and the other, and they may not even be around in two weeks because they, they have had a terminal illness that you didn't know about. You better be thankful that you have your own little problem. And stop having these pity parties and celebrate the goodness of the Lord for giving you relatively minor problems. You think you got problems? You don't have any problems. Do an inventory of other people sitting around. Then you'll really be thankful that you, just yesterday, the woman who was president at the college that my, my wife worked as one of the provosts, she was in the legislature down in Alabama. She's a millionaire, marriage, got a name on buildings, everything else. But nothing could save her. She died yesterday. She hadn't even turned 70 because we didn't know it, but she was all torn up inside. Living that ruthless high life, eventually going to catch up with you. And so you got to be careful. I don't want my name on any building. I want my name on a crown that the Lord will reserve for me. So the thing is, friends, uh, this Christmas, we have to look at not uh, giving material things, most of which we can't afford. We got to put them on credit cards. I can only say that because it made, made me give up my credit cards. I, was, I just spent too much. I just couldn't afford it all. Amen. I had to file Chapter 13 bankruptcy. It wasn't my own recklessness. I had people in my family who were going to help me spend it. I didn't know they were helping me spend it. <laughs> and uh, I'm, just, I'm just being real. See, I'm just letting you see that it is not you think you got it under control and you don't know that people in your own house are selling you down the river. You think you got problems. That's why I don't pay too much attention to all the nice things. I mean, it's nice that people say something. I have, a, you know, written some books here downstairs. In fact, I'm taking a, a trip to Egypt, and I want some of you, if you can afford it, save up your pennies. Uh, and maybe you would have a nice experience by coming with us next March. The brochures are here. Do you have them? Our trip to Egypt. Jesus, when he was born, his father was given the instruction Take the child and flee to Egypt. And then there in Matthew 2.15, there is the Old Testament fulfillment citation out of Hosea 11 and 1, quoted from there. For this was to fulfill the scripture, out of Egypt I have called my child. So I'm going back to Egypt, and I invite some of you, if you know somebody else who would like to join us on, we're leaving from Dallas Airport, flying straight on Turkish uh, Airlines to Istanbul, and then from there, after a day tour of the wonderful churches and cathedrals and mosques in Istanbul, Turkey, we're going to fly over to Cairo, then we're going to sail down the Nile River. Come, you don't need to just see it in the Bible, come and see for yourself. If you want to give something, why not give a trip to the land of Israel in the Old Testament? We can go there, we're going on next March. Out of Egypt I have called my child. You know that the rededication of yourself, I'm about finished here, the rededication of yourself begins with a rediscovery of the fact that we are connected to Africa. We are Egyptians. We are Ethiopians. We are Africans. Even as no European looking fella back there, he's an African. 
because all of humanity was started in Africa. See what I mean? And so, so, so that's what's so remarkable about our journey is that we are going back to the lands of the Bible to rededicate ourselves to a new spiritual future. And every single one of you, young or old today, can recalibrate your relationship with the Lord with a sense of recognizing that in 2012, 12, an important biblical number, that in 2012, this Christmas, you're going to give less material things and give more spiritual things. Give more, no, don't recognize, maybe there's someone in your family, that, that an elderly person or a shut-in person that just needs to see your face because you haven't called up a long time. Maybe there's someone in your family that, that, you, that just needs something that has nothing to do with money. They just need you to give them a hug sometimes. Why not show the love of Christmas if you, if you say that you've fallen in love with Jesus? A lot of, most people, they don't fall into love. They fall into lust. Amen. Amen. And they call it love. No, no, no. We're talking about genuine spiritual love. An agape, a love that is unmerited. A love that you show a person when they don't even seem to deserve it. But yet it's a love that you give them because you see in them a coming hope for their future that they don't even see. That's what I'm talking about. Why not become the gift that we all really need and want this Christmas? And so, there is an interesting way to put this. You know, when Jesus was born in very humble circumstances, born in a stable where they keep horses, laying in the, on a bed of straw in a manger, how much humble can you be? There was no room for him in the hotel. And that's how the story goes. But yet kings from the east, three kings came to find where is this new king, a different king who is now born in our midst. We've heard. We've seen this star. And now we've come to find him. Well, there he is in the manger. That, that little king? Yes, that's the one who has a great future. There's some young people right here, maybe this morning or today, who have a great future, but you wouldn't really know it. But if we as a church and we as parents really believe in this child, girl or boy, they could be yakking and gossiping back there on that little children's road. I'm going to come back there and get them. <laughs> All they want, but we, there is hope for their future. If we can show them God's love as the church, because we then become the givers. Now, the many of us, insignificant. We think we've rolled the hill, God's finished with us. Let me just say, God can take the most insignificant individual and before they know it, do something very significant with them. Listen to this. He grew up, talking about Jesus, he was born in a stable, bed of straw. He grew up in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He worked in a carpenter's shop until he was 30. And then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never owned a home. He never had a family, really. He never went to college. He never traveled more than 200 miles from where he was born. He didn't do any of the things usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials except his own himself. While he was a young man, the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends all ran away. His disciples abandoned him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. And while he was dying, his execution, executioners gambled for the only object of property that he had, and that was his coat. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through a pity of a friend. By all standards, he was very insignificant. Yet 2,000 years have come and gone. And all armies that ever marched, and all of the navies that ever sailed, and all of the governments and parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned, put them all together. They have not affected the life of men and women on this earth as much as this one solitary individual whose birthday we are soon to celebrate yet again. Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior of this unredeemed world. 
He was insignificant by all human standards. But isn't it interesting? We have forgotten the name of all of these kings and queens and Caesars and huge millionaires and being a They don't mean anything. But the name of Jesus Christ is a name above all names. Because we, the church, are celebrating it even here uh, at this wonderful Ecclesia Worship Center, Family Life and Work at Worship Center. Oh, you're a small, insignificant group, aren't you? You don't have a big cathedral. You got to play your music in these creative, alternative ways, but it sounds pretty good to me downstairs. You're doing some live streaming here. You're way ahead of your time. Thanks be to God for this ministry, and thanks be to God to all of you who have invested yourselves in it. I'll be downstairs with our book table if you can, but thank you for this invitation. And I am just happy to be a colleague with one of my former students. She said to me, you know, that one of the reasons I didn't graduate, Dr. Feller. I said, will you please hush your mouth? <laughs> Not only did you graduate, you have graduated well beyond what we offer at the school. Amen. <laughs>